morning, and I'll just start with a couple of uh, things related to logistics. We'll pass it on to our Dean, Dr. Diane Koenig, so she can uh, talk about uh, Dr. Shirley Stinson's legacy a little bit, then I'll introduce you, and then I pass it over to you. Okay, so welcome everybody to our Faculty of Nursing Shirley Stinson Lecture and join me in welcoming our guest speaker, Dr. Josephine Wang. Thank you so much for uh, joining us and for agreeing to give this lecture, Dr. Wang. Um, the title of this lecture is Beyond the Crossroad, Taking Committed Action to Advance Health Equity Through Critical Nursing Pedagogy and Research. Just a couple of housekeeping things first. You may have noticed that uh, on Zoom today, some things are different than you may used uh, than you may be used to seeing them. This is because this is a webinar uh, interface that we're using to allow for a sufficient number of participants. That's not the regular Zoom account you may use usually. This is why I think. The point to ask you to keep your mics muted is mute because. Um, it looks like I have to explicitly allow you to talk. So if you have comments, if you have questions throughout, please feel free to use the chat function and I'll monitor the chat and uh, uh, either read the comments to Dr. Wong or we will respond by unmuting you. And uh, if you raise your hand, I see that you have a question so I can allow you to talk. And just so you are aware, we are recording this meeting so we can make the session available after uh, the lecture to everybody who might not be able to join or who may be willing to listen in again. So this is a picture actually that reflects my one of my very first impressions uh, that I got and that really deeply stuck with me when I came to Canada first. I came to Canada, well, I was there before a couple of times, but I came here for a longer stay for a three-year postdoc in May 2014. So everything was still snowy. And when I looked out of the airplane window, I was just completely taken aback and stunned by the, the sheer flatness of, of this country. So much water, like all these little lakes, ponds, snow, and everything flat. This is just nothing that I was used to at all. I was coming from Germany and Europe in general it's, it's rarely that flat and rarely that sparsely inhabited. So it, it's just something that impressed me deeply, especially because I was sleep deprived and was taking it in, not like with any kind of rationality. I was just standing out of the window trying to keep awake. So these, these are my first impressions of, um, of the land that I encountered when I was coming here. And more and more I uh, connected with that land really. I, I'm a person who likes to be outdoors. I like to run, I like to cycle, I like to hike. And that allows you to experience and feel and connect with the land quite intensely, especially here in Alberta where it can get down to minus 30, 35 degrees Celsius in winter. So the connection and the, <laughs> the uh, feeling when connecting with the land are not always an easy one and not always uh, comfortable and pleasant, but they're definitely always intense. So with that said, and also always this ambivalent feeling of um, being a guest on this land twice, basically, neither am I born here, nor is the land we're, that we're talking about, um, like, let's put it that way, it was owned by, by other people. It was owned by indigenous people. So it's kind of a feeling of being a, a guest in, in two different layers. So in addition to the, the feeling of joy and, and, and the, the, the gratefulness of being here and all the vastness and the, the uh, 
beauty of the country, there is always this feeling of ambivalence, which I think is part of uh, reconciliation and of uh, thinking things through. So with that said, um, the University of Alberta is located on Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional gathering place for diverse indigenous peoples, including the Cree, Blackfoot, Métis, Nakoda Sioux, Iroquois, Dene, Ajibwai, Salto, and Anishinaabe, Inuit, and many others whose histories, languages, and cultures continue to influence our vibrant communities. And since we meet via a virtual platform today, very likely the lands that we call home go beyond the Treaty 6 territory. So to reaffirm our commitment and responsibility for improving relationships between nations, as well as our understanding of the diverse indigenous peoples and their cultures, we would like to acknowledge the importance of all these lands. All right, I see there is still a couple of comments going on saying you're not able to join. Oh, that, that's your former comment, Josephine. Okay, all right. So with that, I would like to pass it over to Dr. Koenig, who will talk about Dr. Shirley Stinson's legacy. And I think Dr. Koenig, I will have to make you a panelist so you can't even talk. Wait a second. So allow to talk. And Diane, do you need uh, to share your screen? Uh, no, I don't, Matthias, but I, I would appreciate if you yes. knowing that you can hear me. <laughs> we, we can definitely hear you. It just doesn't look like I can make you a co-host uh, as well. So you might need to do without video. <laughs> Uh, that's just fine with me. Uh, nobody wants to see me anyhow. Um, but uh, I want to start actually by thanking you very much, Matthias, uh, for your thoughtful introduction, but for your work to make this happen. The Dr. Shirley Stinson Day is an important one for all of us in the Faculty of Nursing. And given all the changes in the last uh, while, it has been difficult to find a way to move forward to honor her. And I appreciate that the work that you've done on this. Uh, and I want to start by welcoming to all of our colleagues and students and friends. And on behalf of the Faculty of Nursing, I am so pleased to be able to have this moment to honor uh, Dr. Shirley Stinson, and I'm very grateful that you are joining us here today virtually to celebrate nursing research and its life-changing and societal changing potential. Uh, as Matea said, my name is Diane Koenig and I'm the Acting Dean at the University of Alberta Faculty of Nursing. It's my pleasure to welcome you all today to our virtual lecture. Alberta has played a crucial role in the profession of nursing, especially present day as our nurses are working tirelessly to navigate us safely away from the fourth wave due to the COVID-19 pandemic. And we owe so much of our advances today to the generation of nurses who came before us. These trailblazers are the bedrock of our profession and the research we do here at the University of, at the Faculty of Nursing. Today, we're commemorating a remarkable and cherished member of our faculty nursing community, Dr. Shirley Stinson. Shirley, or Cheryl, as we all were told to call her, was a force in the profession of nursing, a visionary leader, a committed teacher, a trailblazing researcher, and a globally recognized administrator and consultant. Her contributions have done nothing short of changing the face of nursing care in Canada and improving the standards of patient care across the world. Dr. Stinson was both first nurse and the first woman to receive the Senior National Health Scientist Research Award and she received the Canada's two highest nursing awards, the Ross Award in Nursing Leadership from the Canadian Nurses Foundation and the Canadian Nursing Association's Jean Mance Award. 
In addition to numerous lifetime memberships, Dr. Stinson received the University of Minnesota's Board of Regents Outstanding Achievement Award and Columbia University's Distinguished Alumni Award. Dr. Stinson was the recipient of the Sir Frederick Halton Prize in Humanities from the Government of Alberta. She was inducted into the Alberta Order of Excellence in 1999 and appointed to the Order of Canada in 2001. This list only scratches the surface of the depth and breadth of Dr. Stinson's reach the real impact of which is measured in the ongoing number of lives that she has improved. At the University of Alberta, Faculty of Nursing in 1969, Dr. Stinson advanced her strong belief that graduate nursing students require knowledge of advanced clinical nursing practice, including theory, research, and history. And this became the foundation on which she helped establish Western Canada's first master's in nursing program in 1975. She also worked with colleagues from the University of Alberta and the University of Calgary to design and lay the foundation for the first Canadian PhD nursing program, which was instituted in 1991. Through Dr. Stinson's leadership and advocacy, the Alberta Foundation for Nursing Research was established in 1982, and she served as its founding chair, making Alberta the first province or state in the Western world to earmark funds explicitly for nursing research. The foundation raised nursing's credibility as a professional discipline and affirmed the importance of nursing research in healthcare. Shirley Stinson is profoundly missed within our community, yet her contributions will be experienced for generations to come, both within and beyond our faculty, and notably also within and beyond our profession. Her life's commitments are a tribute to all nurses and a reminder of the unbroken chain of commitment between nursing generations, past, present, and future. We are grateful to Dr. Stinson for her dedication, her passion, her humility, and her unwavering vision. And her legacy inspires us to live up to her professional legacy. It's fitting today that today's virtual lecture presented by Dr. Josephine Wong discusses social justice and equity, a theme that truly honors the legacy of Dr. Shirley Stinson. I hope Dr. Wong's critical dialogue will motivate each of us to take action on what matters through nursing education and research. Thank you so much for joining us today and I look forward to the lecture. Thank you so much, Dr. Diane Kunick. Um, my name, by the way, is Matthias Hoban. I'm an assistant professor with the Faculty of Nursing at the University of Alberta. And I chaired a planning committee that helped organize this lecture that we are uh, attending today. And I wanna thank Dr. Josephine Wang again for uh, agreeing to give this lecture. Just a couple of words uh, to your person, Dr. Wang. Dr. Josephine Wang is a professor with the Daphne Cockwell School of Nursing at the Ryerson University. She also holds adjunct appointments with the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and with the Graduate Program in Environmental Studies at the York University. And in October 2020, uh, she received the Endowed Research Chair in Urban Health. Her areas of expertise include critical public health, urban health equity, social ident identities and health practices, structural violence and health inequities, community engaged responses to pandemics, community based action research, stigma, HIV and mental health, and intervention research, implementation research. 
Her entire program of research is underpinned by the principles of social justice and equity. And Dr. Wang is deeply committed to doing research with and not for affected communities. She seeks to answer the so what and what then questions in her research. And therefore, she works closely with affected communities <coughs> to develop socially uh, innovative solutions that promote collective resilience and social change, going beyond understanding specific phenomena about health inequities. And when I asked her if there is anything else uh, that she wants me to add, she told me that she aspires to be a comedian for social justice. And I think that's probably best if you speak to that yourself, what you mean by that, Dr. Wong. And with that, I wanna pass it over to you and thank you again for giving this lecture today. Thank you very much, Dr. Hoban. Um, I feel very grateful to have this opportunity to engage with you, um, with everyone at your school, uh, faculty members, students, and whoever else joined, because this is a free lecture, to engage in dialogue and collaborative learning. I know that I'll be learning from you also in honor of Dr. Stinson's distinguished contribution to the nursing discipline in terms of research that is really important that ties to our practice. So I say a bit more about my aspiration maybe at the end of the lecture. Um, I'm, going, I'm joining you right now uh, from Takaronto, which was built in the dish with one spoon territory. The dish with one spoon territory is a treaty between the Anishinaabe Mississaugas and Haudenosaunee that bound them to share the territory and protect the land. As a 1.5 generation immigrant settler, I am very mindful about my relationship with indigenous peoples across Turtle Island, my responsibility of taking care of the land and all beings on the land, and as well as keeping harmony and peace that cannot come without equity and justice. I'm also mindful about how I have benefited from the land and resources stolen from indigenous peoples from the Canadian prosperity that was built on the enslaved labor of indigenous and black people in Canada and in North America and the ongoing colonial governing systems in Canada and elsewhere. I'm mindful of my responsibilities in truth and reconciliation and my accountability to act in solidarity to dismantle structural violence against indigenous black and racialized peoples and other marginalized groups locally in Canada and globally. So now I'm going to uh, share my PowerPoint and I promise I will not take all the time because I have a tendency and that would make me a very good comedian. I'm supposed to be concise. So I'm going to share um, my PowerPoint and because I have a pretty old computer, so then now I will have to make it a PowerPoint show and then I stop sharing. I learned this from teaching and then I share it again and it will work. So the focus of my talk um, and sharing with you today is about beyond the crossroad and taking community action to actually advance health equity through critical nursing pedagogy and research. And as I acknowledge where I'm speaking from, um, I recently found out that Takaronto is actually a Mohawk word that is about the place in the water where the trees are standing, the place where the fish weirs are. And to me, this um, finding was insightful in the sense that I often see landscape pictures of Canada and whereby we don't see who had been here, the history behind the land and who are still living here and where people are living. And so learning about this actually really reminded me that there had been indigenous peoples, First Nations people living on the land for thousands of years before many of us ever come to uh, this land. So in today's talk, I would like to 
talk a bit about collective witnessing and how does collective witnessing really function as connection and reconnection? And what are the relational principles in nursing and human services um, tied to social justice, equity, and compassion is also another part that is very important. Within nursing, we often talk about caring, um, nursing as a caring principle or discipline, but what does it mean to be caring? Can we do caring without compassion? And I would like to speak a bit about how I apply some of these principles in education and teaching, as well as in my research and, and practice. And how do I come to make committed action? And what inspired me very often is what Justice Murray Sinclair had talked about when he and the commission actually released the report. We have described for you a mountain. We have shown you a path to the top. We call upon you to do the climbing. And I often think about this and think about how I'm going to do the climb and how I would be in the best position to do the climb with all of you because we do it in solidarity so that we can support each other to do it. The collective witnessing that many of us and perhaps all of us had gone through in the past two years had been very traumatizing for some and is definitely not usual. I recall not this past summer, but uh, the summer before in 2020, when I was teaching one of the courses, the kind of pain expressed by my students, especially students who are black and racialized and Asian students who had experienced violence on the street because of the increased hate. So here I have pulled in um, pictures of all the stuff that we had actually witnessed together through the news, through the media, through personal stories from our friends, through personal stories from people we come into contact with. So not only that there was the COVID-19 that really threw everybody's routine out of the window, but the kind of witnessing of the ongoing violence and the violence that actually, because of social media and the media that enable us to see it, that it make us connect to something that is beyond watching it as news. And there's lots of inequities. We also concern about climate change. There are the issues of, you know, ongoing violence towards indigenous people in the hospital setting, through the, the RCMP, uh, policing, and then there is also the um, uncovering of unmarked graves. Then there is the terrorist killing of Muslim family in London, Ontario. All these are really overwhelming. And at the same time, we're also dealing with fires in the West Coast, and then more recently flooding. And this month, the Canadian Federation of Nurses Union had updated the names of people who had died from COVID-19 who were healthcare workers. And I counted over the 50 names that had been named and the majority of them are people who are working so-called in the bottom hierarchy of the healthcare system. So people who are working as nurses aid uh, personal support worker, cleaners, porter within the healthcare system. The majority of them who died from COVID-19 in Canada are actually these frontline workers. What I would also like to remind ourselves is that while all this convergence of collective witnessing had really intensified how we feel emotionally and spiritually, these are actually not new things that we know. In the past, we have continuously swept under the rug that the kind of structural violence related to colonialism, to white supremacy, to racism, to genocide, to slavery, they had happened 
on this land for hundreds of years, but we were able to avoid, swept it under the rug, not talk about it. And so these are the type of collective amnesia because of all this convergence of events and the kind of emotions that actually brought out. And now that young people from all walks of life are actually speaking out that we are no longer able to just hide it and not deal with it. And what we need to actually look at is how structural, um, structured ignorance is reinforcing the kind of structural violence that continue to happen in our society. And some of the evidence that I wanted to point out and share that you might already know is that when we look at COVID-19 cases, it's not surprising that is actually people who are in the lowest income brackets are the one who actually had the highest rate and beyond the share of the population. Here again, racialized, uh, racialization of poverty is also nothing new. Here is some data from 2019, even before the pandemic, that certain racialized group in Canada are actually living under poverty. And this is an issue that we know, and yet the structure, the system, and the status quo and the neoliberal way of living, whether it's tied to our work or tied to our personal life, had made it really difficult for us to take time and actually contemplate and think about it and identify strategy. What can we do about it? And here's some data uh, regarding uh, Edmonton in the CMA area. And very much like in Toronto and other large cities, you can see here that racialization of poverty and gendered poverty is also happening. And just like across different cities um, and different area across Canada, again, indigenous people had a high rate, three times that of non-Aboriginal people, their poverty rate. And when we look at the GIS mapping, then we can see here that poverty is also distributed uh, spatially, and that would tie to a lot of the environmental issue when we talk about climate change. And during the pandemic, when Statistics Canada actually do the survey, again here now we see that racialized people had perceived that they had higher harassment um, in their neighborhood and compared to non-visible minority uh, communities. So these are evidence that are plenty, and I don't need to even go further because many of you actually had uh, draw on those evidence um, during you know, your professional work. In the recent past couple of weeks, we had heard lots, lots of narratives, voices, and it's really great to see that there's climate activism by young people Adults of all ages are concerned. People talk about it you know, on radio across the country about how concerned they are for the future generation and that we have to do something. Of course, then at the summit, politics come in and there are lots of debates about action targets and timeline. But what I want to point out is that those narratives, those activism, those stories of enthusiasm, passion, and solidarities are important, but we cannot wait until we meet those timelines and target because environmental injustice actually had already happened across Canada in different communities. So a recent article uh, in a newspaper about Vancouver. So when we think about uh, the heat waves that had happened, people who had died because the city wasn't prepared and the city had learned. But once again, whenever there's disaster, there are things that cities across the world, they are not prepared. Usually it's the most marginalized people who actually become the sacrifice of our learning. And so here it is showing that uh, downtown Eastside in you know the 
area that's further away uh, from the waterfront, they don't benefit from the, the shades and the cooling effect. And therefore, climate change that had already happened is already affecting uh, these marginalized population. And so what are we going to do about it? Again, here in Toronto, when we talk about environmental injustice, talking about neighborhood. So over the years on the left-hand side, you can see that these are the GIS mapping of um, Toronto, city of Toronto, and the central area remain to have the high income areas. And then when we tied it to the percentage of students who have access to sports and recreation within the neighborhood, again, is really reflecting that it has something to do with income. And then when I put in the map for black population in Toronto, then once again, we see that low income and the lack of access to recreation within neighborhood affect the black populations within our city. And so I have been really appreciative of technology of GIS mapping that allow us to actually look and make sense of this data within a short period of time and can compare and really engage community people, students, everyone in dialogue. Other parts about racial segregation and environmental racism that had happened also for years. And there is a uh, CBC feature that had done in 2018 that talk about the case of uh, Shelburne in Nova Scotia. And we can see on the map on the right hand side that this is absolutely an example of structural violence because in neighborhood where black people and black communities are living tied to socioeconomic status, that's where the province actually and, and the municipality have put where all the dump sites are. And then now it's documented that cancer rates are a lot higher. And so then the health inequity really ties to it. And yet it is so hard for ordinary people who are most affected to actually be able to do something. So communities had to rely on researchers, rely on journalists, and rely on activism beyond their own communities to work together to raise this issue so that it has to be done. And what is also really touching is when a community member, when Louise Delisle actually talked about, it's not only about the health inequity, ties to the health inequity and this environmental pollution is also the stigma of living in this community so that if you live close to the dump, you wouldn't be accepted. And these are the kind of narratives and sharing that I've heard not even related to this community in Nova Scotia. I have young men, young black men, young racialized men who told me that they would never be able to get a summer job living in some of the inner city, low income neighborhoods with community violence because when the employer, potential employer look at their address, they just would not pick them for an interview. So when we look at environmental racism, it's also interconnected to all kinds of other social structure, uh, violence and, and, and stigma and discrimination. So then when we talk about collective witnessing and connection or reconnection, what are we reconnecting to? Personally, I would say that based on my conversation with colleagues, with family members, with community people, and my own experience over the last two years, there is a reconnection to our collective humility. And I used to call this collective humanity, and I stopped calling it humanity because when we still focus on our humanity, we are not going to contribute to environmental justice and have the same kind of honor and respect for all other creatures and beings that actually is in the ecosystem that is sustaining our survival and our well being. It is also reconnection and new connection to insight on our joint efforts. I was. Um, as much as going through a lot of this hardening 
witnessing all this news, I was also given hope when I see that now we're seeing people from all racial background, all walks of life, and all ages coming out together in all the activism, insight on unwavering courage. I recently had dialogue with colleagues at my own school, and we talk about the difference between boldness and courage. And I advocate for us to actually connect to courage because the difference between courage and boldness is that with courage, we do have fear. We are anxious. We are afraid that we may fail. We are scared how it would affect us personally, whether it's safe for us. But courage is about despite the fear, despite the anxiety, despite this unknowing, we will take action. Whereas boldness is more about, I had no fear and therefore I'm going to go and do something. And when we are talking about justice and challenging things that have been for centuries, we do need courage. It's okay to be fearful as long as we go in solidarity, that we can find strength in solidarity so that we can go on together. The other part is about truth. And we had heard from many indigenous elders and leaders and colleagues who talk about there could not be any reconciliation without truth. And learning truth also requires to have courage. Insight on interdependence. Um, as I get older and as I learn more, I really feel that interdependence is something that we must connect to and talk about. And this often come in contradictory to how we learn uh, because I used to hear from elders in my own communities to talk about you young people, when I was young, I'm no longer that young, that you young people come to North America and you want to be independent. And this is not going to work. Now, of course, our elderly relatives, they are not you know, intellectuals, they are not academics, and they could not explain to us about the problem, about this whole notion of independence. All they can talk about is now you're losing your culture, you don't even know your roots. And the insight on interdependence for me, now that I'm stepping to slowly become an elder, is really about how I cannot exist without you and you cannot exist without me. And if we're truly going to live a flourishing life that is equitable for all of us, then we really need to recognize that interdependence. Compassion is something that is again very important. And I often had discussion with my students and colleagues about what's the difference between compassion and empathy. Compassion is really about not only feeling and being able to try our best to understand the suffering that the other person is going through or the other communities are going through, but it's also about having the desire to do something. So having empathetic feelings on its own is not enough. It's about, do I have the courage and do I have the desire to do something about it? And reconnecting to equity, the whole principles about equities. So you can see here, I'm not a comedian yet, but at least I come up with a, a good acronyms of the insight on when all these things are together, it actually spells justice. At the same time, uh, because my area of research also connect to mental health, there are lots of anxiety, especially amongst young people, because the lack of groundedness, the unforeseeable future, the sense of loss of control about what is happening in the world could actually bring a lot of anxiety, pessimism, and hopelessness. And those type of thinking and feeling could actually immobilize us. So then what can nurses do? What can each one of us do personally, professionally, politically, and spiritually? And in the last 10 years, I have been bringing in 
the whole notion about spirituality within my teaching because I feel that that part is important. This is not about religion. This is not about dogma. It is really about connecting to there's a certain part of us that is really beyond the everyday way of thinking and our cognition that we could tap into. So then at this moment, um, as I talk to uh, Matthias that I think is a torture if someone had to listen to me for 45 minutes. So right now I'm going to invite you to do something with me. And what I would like you to do is for you sitting on your chair or wherever you are, you could be lying on the floor and watching this um, presentation. I invite you to take a moment if you're willing and if you're not willing, it's perfectly okay. It's just to find a very comfortable position and just sit there. And I'm going to guide you to connect to the present moment. And this is an invitation. If you feel comfortable, I would invite you to close your eyes. If that is something uncomfortable for you, just lower your gaze or focus on something in front of you that you can focus on. Now I will invite you to take in three breaths. Just take a deep breath in three times, breathing in and breathing out. Let your tension be released. If you're really feeling very tense, then I invite you as you breathe that you actually raise your shoulder as high as possible as if you want it to touch your earlobe. And as you breathe out, you just drop your shoulder and let go. So breathing in, you are aware that you're breathing in. Breathing out, you're able to sense your abdomen going in as you breathe out. Now I'll invite you to imagine that is in the summer again you can feel a nice warm breeze. It's one of those days that is not too hot. And you're just sitting in the park by yourself while the whole city is under lockdown or restricted mobility because of the pandemic. You're sitting in the park by yourself you can feel the gentleness of the breeze on your face. You can feel the sensation of your body as it's sitting on the bench. Now you look up at the sky, the sky is blue and you're seeing a lot of white clouds drifting by. Just relax and observe and watch the clouds. You may notice that there are all, all kinds of thoughts coming into your mind. It might be about, here I'm at this presentation, how am I ever going to meet that deadline for tomorrow? Or you may be thinking, what am I going to cook for dinner tonight? It's okay to acknowledge those thoughts. What I would like to invite you to do is when the next thought comes in, no matter whether it's a pleasant thought, whether it's a worry, take that thought and put it on one of the white clouds in the sky and watch it floats away.
continue to do this. As you notice any sensation in your body, ideas, thoughts, just take it and put it on the white clouds and watch them slowly float away. If you're feeling that there are lots of thoughts coming into your mind and there's no way you can put them all on the clouds, there just is enough time, that I'll invite you to go back to your breath. As you breathe in, notice that you're breathing in. You don't need to do anything except just to connect with your breath. As you breathe out, you recognize that you're breathing out. Now, slowly, I will invite you to let go of the blue sky, let go of the white clouds, let go of that park bench and just return to here and now. Notice the sensation of your body that is touching the chair or the cushion or the floor that you're sitting on. Notice the sensation on the palm of your hand, wherever they are resting. I'll invite you to breathe just like ordinary times, three more times, breathing in and out, in and out, in and out. And now I invite you back to the presentation to be with each other. And thank you for taking the time to do this with me. Now I'm gonna move on to talk about beyond the crossroad. I think after the last two years and with what is happening currently, there isn't really any space for us to have hesitation, we know that as nurses, as citizens, as global citizens, as fellow human being, we have to take action. We can really just stay in the intersection and wonder where are we going to go? So I'm going to introduce to you a model that my colleague, uh, Dr. Ellen Lee, who is a primary care physician working in HIV, and Dr. Kenneth Fung, who's a cultural psychiatrist working with immigrants and refugees. And the three of us have been working over the last 10 years in research to look at how can we do something to intervene with stigma and discrimination that are not really individual behaviors or individual feelings, but more something that is really reinforced by uh, structural violence and, and inequities. So in the middle, you see a diagram that actually had six processes. On the left-hand side is about diffusion, acceptance, and then in the middle is about present moment and self as context. And the little activities that I invited you to do with me just now is my invitation for you to experience. Many of you probably might have already practiced mindfulness or different kinds of spiritual practice that you already do, but some of you might not have. And then on the right hand side is about values and commit to action. So the middle diagram is based on 
acceptance and commitment therapy, which is a third wave psychotherapy that had been used in the last 30 years. And there's lots of um, evidence to show that it works with people experiencing challenges with addiction, uh, diabetes, um, any kind of you know, health challenges that they have difficulty dealing with, anxiety, depression. What we found as we started using this model is that because it's a psychological model, it often connects people at the personal and the interpersonal level, but not really address the structural issue. And prior to actually applying this model, this therapy, we had always been doing empowerment education for many, many years now, since you know, the early 2000s. And after we had done uh, some intervention, testing both models separately, we had come to the conclusion based on our insight and learning and evidence that we actually really need to bring them together. And how we come about bringing the two models together were actually because of voices from the communities. So we had done a, a study to look at why a social justice leaders not paying attention to HIV stigma and how come social media um, leaders also are not paying attention to, to HIV stigma. And we found out that a lot of times because community experience triple, multi-triple stigma tied to racism, tied to poverty, tied to all kinds of issues. So HIV just does not seem to be an issue they want to deal with, or they feel that I don't think we should take that on because here's another thing for people to stigmatize our communities. And when we took the findings out to the communities, we did three consultation forums with people who mostly living with HIV, who are immigrants, refugees, racialized people, or they are LGBTQ plus communities. And we presented five models about social marketing campaign, about empowerment education, about cognitive behavioral therapy, about acceptance and commitment therapy. And out of all these models, we say, please choose one and we will try to find funding to do something. And the community at all three forums say, no, we don't want to choose one. We want to choose ACT. We also want to have empowerment education because we do not passively want people to think that people can just give us services. We want to engage and be empowered so that we can actually have some self-determination about our communities and our lives. So this is how the model come together and we were grateful that we were able to actually listen to the communities. So I'm just going to quickly go through uh, this model. Um, at the personal level, this applied to all of us as individual or as individual nurses and psychological inflexibility is what something that caused suffering. And a lot of times it might tie to uh, our fusion with ideas and rules or stories. So there's all kinds of stories. So for instance, um, as we listen to all the work that Dr. Stinson had done in our discipline so many years ago, but in the past, nurses and other people could be fused with the ideas that, you know, nurses are only there to do the individual caring, and we really do not have the leadership research doesn't belong to us. If we are fused with those ideas, then we will never be at where we are at today, where nursing leaders are actually leading uh, research and using the evidence to actually improve practice. Experiential avoidance is related to us that because we had some negative experience in the past, the anxiety and fear actually stop us from having the openness to actually experience things again. And I used to see that a lot at uh, a sexual health clinic when young people came in because they were hurt in a relationship because they have got um, herpes that is not curable, then they decided that they are not worthy to actually be dating anybody else or be in any kind of social life with anybody else. So those type of experiential avoidance actually will stop anyone 
from having a flourishing life and achieving their goals. And at the top, uh, we see that very often we are stuck in the past and worry about the future. And when we do that, we miss the present moment of the now that we can actually do something to enable each other to flourish. And the Richard idea about self affect us individually and also sometimes professionally. And we often label ourselves, we believe that we are a certain person and we don't think that there's anything else about us. And this is one thing that we tackle a lot when we are working with uh, people living with HIV, especially when they're first diagnosed, because they suddenly feel that the label HIV become them and they're nothing else more than them. And so we use this model to actually support people to see beyond. And on the right-hand side, when we are unclear about our values, then it's really hard for us to know the direction we need to go and have the courage to actually do something. And when we are stuck in all these six processes, then often what we do is we either don't do anything or we do impulsive action. And so we can think about that very often, um, avoidance in terms of health practices could lead to people using substance because they don't want to deal with certain feelings and emotions. And so substance enable them to avoid that for a short period of time. And then the inaction and impulsive action, we can see that there are conflict, community conflicts and violence that often happen in those areas too. So then when we talk about epistemic knowledge and injustice, and you know, as I was preparing for this presentation, I want to look at how this model can actually be applied to us in research, in teaching, and in the way we do practice. And the way I see it is that our psychological inflexibility is tied to our epistemic and knowledge injustice. And so when we talk about fusion, it's really about fusion with dominant worldviews, discourses, theories, and knowledge. It's also about fear or reluctance to explore, learn, or apply new knowledge. And I'm finding that with some students, some of them are very uncomfortable and finding it really difficult to actually um, learn new knowledges or even talk about inequity, talk about racism, because that was not something that they were prepared before. And especially if they identify as a white person, they had the fear and feel intimidated to actually have open dialogue. And then uh, at the top here, we can see that we are also looking at how we had non-reflexive way of thinking about the current knowledge and, and the status quo that we are engaged in. So when we're not reflexive, uh, when we engage in our practice, this often, this allow us to actually get into the innovative ways. And non-reflexive is really about our inability to interact and relate to one another at all the different contexts and recognize how our social relations and social position actually influence us. Then there is a non-reflexive engagement with truth. And I'm learning more and more as I work in the community challenging injustice and challenging stigma that some people really do have a fear of engaging with truth. And I tie that, and as you can see in the diagram, all these processes are actually interlinked. And I tie that fear to really unclear about values. And when our values is actually not clear, then we don't have the direction or courage to actually challenge ourselves and challenge and, and have the desire to unlearn what we have learned in the past. And often we fall into blaming ourselves or we want to avoid and just say that it's someone else's issue, someone else's fault. And then again, all that would lead to inaction. And then what I also want to point out is that very often 
nurses, particular nurses in clinical practice, whether it's in the community or in the hospital, that very often their stories and their understanding and the experience are not actually analyzed in the systemic and organizational level. And for us to have the courage, for us to be able to open up, to be reflexive, to learn new world views, we need the support of organization. We need the support of the, the faculty, of the university, of the hospital, of the community health center, of everywhere that we are. And also, we had a long way to go in challenging the unequal power relations that also exist in these systems and in these organizations. So then when we move to uh, psychological uh, flexibility, and I see here that how we can do it is epistemic uh, knowledge and justice. It's really tied to also our personal life. And diffusion is about, am I able to actually let go and recognize that many things that I believe in are only ideas and stories, but they're not the reality or truth. And at the professional level and at the organizational level, are we able to decenter the dominant knowledge system? So in countries like Canada, and other countries with a settler um, nation, then what we need to decenter is really the Western dominance Eurocentric system. However, I also want to point out that not everybody around the world is stuck in uh, domination by Eurocentric ideas. We have all kinds of countries right now going through where people do not have the freedom to say anything together. So there's a dominant system of oppression there that might not have something to do with the West, but linked to the West, because we know that with the international big corporation and how we tie to the advanced capitalism, we're all interconnected. But so decentering those dominant knowledge systems, we need to pay attention to the context to it. Acceptance is openness to different ways of knowing and learning. And it's the knowing and learning that is really important. When we do research, how do we start to challenge ourselves from sticking and fuse to the only methodology that we had learned in the past and feel that that is the only way I can go and do research with a participant or that is the only way that my student must learn. And I personally, as a teacher, do not want to see my student regurgitate everything that they can learn. And I really want them to connect to themselves as human. Contacting with the present moment um, ourselves, and then in terms of research and teaching and pedagogy is about recognizing that there's no reconciliation without truth. We need to know the past, not get stuck in the past, but know the truth about the past, be here at this moment with the courage to take action in order to reimagine and co-create the future. That's how we are not stuck in the past and the future, but be here and now, but be active. The insights-based and context-based knowing and learning is very important. And as individual self as context is something that we really promote everybody to understand that I am not my past experience. I experience certain things. And just now when I invite you to put your ideas and thoughts and feelings on the cloud, it's an invitation for you to experience what it's like to step back and become an observer of your life and your identity. I'm not the name given by people. This is the reason why nowadays when I go introduce myself, I would never say that I am a professor, I am a researcher. I always say I hold the position because I come to know that I am way more than any identities that anybody can label on me. And I'm still discovering about who I am. And the true being of who I am is actually interconnect to all of you. And therefore, how can I be so um, clear and so sure to say that I am whatever? Because 
We are interacting and everything is still continuing to happen. Values are very important for our own self. I need to connect to what is important to me, not in the material sense, not in terms of reputations and, and success and all that stuff, but the fundamental values that all of us connect with each other, such as kindness, compassion, justice, those type of values. I need to be clear about where I am so that it can, it can lead me. And then committed action is value-based committed action. If I claim to be a compassionate person, then I will need that my action need to reflect that. And that is about understanding other suffering and have the desire to do something about it. And at the same time, I recently was invited to write a short paper for a long-term care facility so that they can distribute it with a local newspaper. And the person want me to write something about compassionate care. And I say, oh, sure. And they say, oh, please go and write something about compassionate care about nurses. And as I took time to actually write about it, what I did, and I took the opportunity. This is why I don't say no to people, but there comes a time when I had to say no. I wanted to dispel that stereotype about nurses or human service providers that we are there to care, doing all the physical care. We are there to meet everybody's needs. And that's all compassion is all about. No, compassion, if we truly want to practice compassion, the first thing that I need to do is also to connect to have self-compassion on myself. Knowing my capacity, knowing when I'm grieving, knowing when I'm suffering, knowing when I need someone's shoulder to cry on, knowing that if I have not done well, it's okay because I do not need to have expectation that I am perfect. That self-compassion is very important because if I do not have self-compassion, I would not have much capacity to have compassion on others. Then I also wrote in that article about organizational compassion, especially because it's a long-term care facility. I wanted to point out that the organization need to have compassion on all its staff and members, regardless of where they are in the hierarchy. And that compassion is about watching out, providing condition that would not get them to burn out. And then there's a societal compassion. I often teasingly tell my students that I am teaching them and therefore I'm holding them accountable. And I would not want to die in a long-term care facility, isolated. I die of thirst, I die of lack of care. And I told them, if that happened to me, I'll come back and haunt them. And of course they just laugh, but I truly am talking about we cannot expect nurses to be compassionate to the service user, the patient, the community they work with, unless they are supported by all the other compassion. So I'm going to stop here uh, because I promised Matthias that I would leave us, you know, 15 to 20 minutes to dialogue. So I'm going to stop sharing and then we can chat. Thank you very much, uh, Josephine, for that deeply impressive presentation. Uh, so let's see uh, if people have questions or comments. I saw that one person posted a question during your presentation and was asking whether you could speak to the issue of gentrification. So let's uh, get us started on that, if you don't mind, and then let's see if people have uh, other questions as well. Okay, um, I would love to talk about the issue of gentrification. So gentrification is really uh, a reflection of what is happening in our society. It is about who has the power to decide and design space. And very often I really um, thank uh, Cassidy Dukes for asking this question because what I find is that in nursing, especially in education, 
we spend so much time worrying because you know we accepted the NCLEX exam, which I opposed. And we are so into teaching nurses all the technical skills. Make sure that our university, our school will reflect that they score higher in, in the NCLEX exam that we have forgotten that the life and the determinants of health of our patients, of our communities, of our surface users are totally tied to all these things. The diagram that I show um, on the right-hand side from the 1970s to you know, the, the, the 1990s, and then you know, even later on into the 2000s, there were changes that we can see that the high-income people had slowly returned and concentrate in the center. They've always been there, but then they had moved from the northeast side of Toronto to come here. And we actually witnessed those, those type of gentrification. Sometimes the neoliberal kind of discourse that come out make it sound really beautiful. For, re, for example, I work with communities at Regent Park in Toronto, which is one of the most disadvantaged neighborhoods with community violence, with, you know, the, the buildings are really not well kept. And it has actually gone through renewal and they brought in money from the private sector. And because of that, so they are building condominiums that would allow uh, some integration of low income, people can still live there and then other people can live in. The evaluation report had not come out yet. But talking to some of the people, I don't think that by putting people in the same building when they are from different racial background and different social class without structure kind of connection, deliberate action to bring people together, that that thing would actually, that gap would actually be together because I see that there are people buying those condos and renting it out to students to our universities. It doesn't mean that it actually had benefit people. And at the same time, every time when revitalization comes, people are moved from the neighborhood. I have done research in low-income neighborhoods. People, it's a community to people. People are together to have relationship and yet they are just displaced. And so the gentrification only, not only separate people break up communities, it also make housing not affordable for ordinary people. And so now we see that with neoliberalism and advanced capitalism, the middle class is shrinking, especially for the young people. So my heart go out to that. And I don't know everything about gentrification, but it surely, surely ties to injustice and inequity. Okay, Cassidy says, thank you for answering Dr. Wong. She really okay. values your perspective on that issue. All right, are there any other questions or comments? I personally really liked uh, how you ended that presentation. And this is because my area of research is really older adults, especially those in nursing homes and how to take care of them. And it, it deeply resonates with me what you just outlined there for sure, especially the issue of like, I would think it's probably not. And that that is actually the problem. You won't starve or like you, you will not be thirsty. But the problem is that you're at high risk that this is about it. So like, the small things that really are important, that, that are totally self-explanatory when you're not in such a home and that you're not receiving when you're there anymore, like being able to have food whenever you want to, getting up whenever you want to, having social connections if needed, all these little things, they, they just don't work out. And we, especially due to COVID-19, we're now thinking really big, we have to revolutionize the system and we have to do the big things which yes, we have to do, but I think to make great success, we have to start thinking smaller. Like we have to create environments and smaller and not with our ambitions, I think, but with our actions. It's the little things that give the residents joy, but for care staff to do that, they have to feel appreciated and they have to work in an environment that appreciates their little things little breaks, even giving them time and making it actually acceptable that the thing that you did with us, close your eyes and breathe 
and just come down so you can't even do your job or like somebody saying thank you feeling appreciated and again management to be able to do that they need to work in an environment that appreciates them and that uh, takes into account these little things so that that deeply resonated with me it's so just the question how do yeah. we get there <laughs> so there are two things that i resonated with what you said the first thing is i totally oppose to privatization of long-term care and elderly care and until we address that in ontario this is going to continue to be heartbreaking and so we are fighting that in Ontario. The other part is uh, one of the study that we're doing is with COVID-19 and is an interactive study. So we don't just go and you know, survey people and all that stuff, it's actually an action project. And we wrote the entire proposal in eight days in February <laughs> because we knew that racism would come. We knew that there'll be fear. Mental health yeah. would be a big issue. So as what you were saying, uh, during the height of wave one, there was a nursing home in downtown Toronto and 50% of their staff were in quarantine. Many of them were sick. They were so short staff. Uh, staff were really uh, stressed out. So what our team did was we get up volunteer and we did exactly what you said. We went in, well, by Zoom, uh, 20 to 30 minutes twice a day during their break time. And it wasn't anything that we weren't talking them to death. We did some mindfulness, but all we did was invite them to talk about things that is meaningful in their life. Mm -hmm. And we did that for two mm -hmm. weeks and that actually really helped them for their mental health. And part of the stuff is we just asked them, what's your favorite song? Yeah. And then we invite them to sing. And then some of them would sing. But what was really touching was that we also found out during that time that there were retired people who actually had retired from the home. And at the call of their colleague, they came back to work. And because they need to rely on you know, staff that are new because they had to recruit, we also work with um, a nursing association in Ontario to try to find them nurses. And they really rely on the retired staff to come back and support them. Mm -hmm. And so those are the, the type of things that, that had happened. And I'm not going to be a comedian. If there's no other question, I don't <laughs> believe in wasting time. So I'm going to share my screen again. So what I want to really talk about is how do we transform the way we know and how do we converge wisdom and how do we actually, you know, move things on. I'm go not going to read this out, but started in the past five years, I have made the commitment to bringing in writers in the courses I teach that are indigenous writers that actually share us with wisdom about life that we often have not learned in the past in our conventional nursing education uh, material. And what we were quite touched, my student and myself, is that when Albert Marshall, who's an elder and also a scholar talk about, it is about life, what you do, what kind of responsibility you have, how you should live while on earth. Those are the type of teaching that might not, you know, make it to, I don't know, one of these prestigious journal or whatever, or be esteemed. But those are the things that actually ground us in our personal life and in practice. And the way that we need to interact with each other is really about how do we interact in ways that we're able to see people's way of seeing the world, way of uh, being in the world so that we actually do not destroy them while we are in the role of helping them. Uh, I also bring in a um, scholar from Asia and this one philosophy talk about pure awareness had no object to be witnessed. It becomes non-dual awareness and turn out to be one with everything. And I brought that in because we are so used, socialized in our society to see everything as dualistic, dichotomous. And so bringing other philosophy and other ways of knowing and other wisdom in support our students to actually open up the way that they see things. And so the awareness is about not looking at objects 
but is completely one with the objects. And I find it um, really amazing when I see that similar kind of knowing and philosophy is also expressed and written by indigenous scholar. And this part is very important um, as this author for Arrows talk about the sense of knowing that when he felt he's totally together with the environment that you know he was in, and that really bring out the beyond humanism that for many, many decades that we have been focusing on. And that is part of the reason I feel that we become so into the advanced capitalism, into technology in ways that actually disconnected ourselves from ourselves. And the another part that I find about praxis that is very important is really about what praxis is all about is how do we relate to each other, talk about what is true and everything in ways that is to people's lived realities. And also in the institutional context that they are in. And that really support us to stop the initial health education in the past before the critical health promotion come out we tend to focus on individual behavior. If you have diabetes and you're not managing it, we are not looking at the stress in their life. We're not looking to the access that they had uh, for the medication and for you know, the tools that they test their blood sugar. We're looking at you're just not keeping to your diet. And I was actually shocked to hear um, on a CBC radio uh, program that someone had been hiding their uh, type two diabetes. For, from their friends for a long time because they stigmatize. So we live in a society where there's too much judgment, too much readiness to kind of make people feel bad rather than actually looking at what is happening in your context in your life that is bringing those realities. And this is a chapter that my colleague and I had written and the acceptance to commitment therapy model there's a lot of borrowing that had not been a knowledge actually from Eastern philosophy. And we want to really push the interconnectedness and the interbeing. And that's why in our model on the outer circle is really about compassion. Interconnection is about equity, about social justice. And without that circle surrounding it, we will be constantly dealing with people's psychology and they might feel better for a few months, but if the structural environment and condition actually do not change, they are going to fall back into health disparity and they're going to go back into the kind of suffering that they have. And so my colleague and I, we are doing research in a way that we want to engage people in a way where it's not only caring about uh, themselves individually, but about each other. So I'm going to stop here. Okay, Josephine, we have one more question in the question and answer uh, rubric here. That okay. is from Marlo. Thank you for your presentation. Can you share your thoughts uh, how nurses can safely advocate for organiza organizational compassion without suffering from possible repercussions? For example, I noticed that nurses prefer to reveal their identities, uh, not to reveal their identities due to fear as they speak to social media. Yes. So I would say that the first thing is your nursing organization. I was disheartened when I saw on Twitter that now there are some new graduate nurses who talk about that, oh, I don't mind working for agency. Now they give us holidays and I can have a flexible schedule. I often remind my student in Ontario, prior to the formation of the union, the Ontario Nurses Association, nurses has very bad working condition, low salary. So for you to do that, I would suggest that we take the collective empowerment capacity building way. Talk to your professional association and also 
engage with the communities. There are all kinds of people out there who are really supporting nurses because they really see that we had contributed a lot. So we can talk through that. The other part is being collective about it. Maybe one signature, you'll be singled out and you will be worried that you'll be reprimanded. But if you have hundreds of signature, that become a voice. And the other part is if you're seeing things that is within the organization, there is a quality improvement, people who are in charge of that. If your situation is actually compromising the well being and safety of patients, it also can be dealt with that way. I, for one, was never afraid to speak out, and I'm still here. I refuse to go to my physics class in grade 11 because my teacher was racist and I refused to go. And my homeroom teacher said, that's very unlike you. You're a very studious student. And I said, I think Mr. So-and-so is racist. I'm not going back until he apologized and he did. So write me <laughs> a private email and I will identify strategies for you to do. Courage is what we need. And sometimes courage would actually open up space for all of us. Thank you so much, Dr. Wang. Uh, I don't see any additional questions or raised hands right now. I want to take one last minute to just thank all the people who helped us set up this lecture. Uh, part of the committee, they were Dr. Vera Kane, Dr. Bukula Salami, Kroti Bias, Muriel Valenzuela, Nick Miller, Brian Thomas, Don McRitchie, and Ellie Wazan. And I want to remind everybody that there is going to be a uh, other facilitated discussion following up this lecture, uh, just to dig deeper and uh, revisit some of the things we discussed here today. That is going to be on December the 1st at 4 p.m. So feel free to join that as well. And as we said, we're going to make the slides and the uh, press, sorry, the recording available for all of you. So thank you so much again, Dr. Wong. That was a pleasure to have you and a very powerful presentation. Thank you very much. And I look forward to down the road going to do some comedy with you. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Take good care. Take good care.